Welcome everyone, Costini here with my comprehensive Projection Paladin main tank guide for World of Warcraft Wrath the Lich King Classic. This is the sequel, if you will, to my Burning Crusade Projection Paladin main tank guide that I did a while ago. And I'm just going to be covering pretty much all you need to know if you're going to be playing a prop paladin in Wrath the Lich King. But first off, I want to touch on, on a very significant point. What is a main tank? If you're taking the view that being a main tank is just slapping on some armor with defensive stats, putting some talent points and doing a rotation, then you are wrong. Being a main tank isn't about that. In fact, your parses, your logs, even your fret and DPS output are insignificant compared to the larger picture. Unless you're in a really good guild with top tier DPSers, then it doesn't really matter as much. But what matters is your awareness, your attitude, your communication skill. A main tank is someone that I consider a quasi raid leader. What do I mean by that? It means someone's that uh, someone that's there in the front, someone who's going to handle the pool, who's going to be able to adapt to changing circumstances, and is going to have a role of importance in the guild that they're in. Someone that the raid leader can rely on to pick up the slack in some ways. Someone that's able to call out cooldowns or what people should do at any given moment in support of the raid leader's effort. You aren't a raid leader, you shouldn't step on their toes, you should respect that, respect those boundaries, but you are going to be there to help them out. A particular example in Wrath of the Lich King is raid cooldowns. There's a lot of external cooldowns that the tank may receive, but it is that tank's job to call them out when need be. Like say for instance, Paladins have Hand of Sacrifice in Wrath of the Lich King, which is a very powerful external cooldown or Desperate Priest with Pain Suppression. And you need to be able to handle those cooldowns in a quick and effective manner. You want to have a raid cooldown add-on, uh, which is going to tell you who in your raid has that in an ideal fashion. Though you don't strictly need it, but what you need is to have awareness, to be aware of what's going on, to be aware of the strengths and weaknesses of your raiding team, and crucially, to play together in a team. Tanking isn't a solo job. I feel that uh, mistaken perception that did exist for a very long time in the game, though perhaps also nowadays, is that tanking is about like people like Kungan who's, who are elevated to godhood. But even people like Kungan, they played in a team. They played with other tanks that they could rely on. They could work together with those tanks. And that is a critical aspect about being a main tank in any guild. It's not just about you. It's about you and one or two or three more people that you're playing with. It is important to establish at least a good working relationship with your fellow tanks. You don't need to be friends, you don't need to even like each other, but you do need to be able to work together in a quick and effective manner. That is going to be important. So tone down the ego, play together with other people, communicate, play to your strengths, play to your weaknesses. If on a certain boss you're better for the off-tanking job, just let the other guy tank the boss and you handle what's actually important. Sarfarian, for instance, is a perfect example of that. The most important job on this boss isn't who tanks the big bad drake, it's the guy who handles all of the ads. It's kind of a miserable job, if I'm being honest with you, but it is the most important job that you can have when, uh, when you're tanking this particular boss. In Illidan, for instance, who tanks the flames is far more important than who tanks the boss, from my perspective. So, it does matter how you work in the team, how you communicate, and play into your strengths and your weaknesses, dependent on your class, dependent on your spec, uh, dependent on the people involved. So don't view tanking as something, oh, put on some armor, go in front of the boss, do a press of buttons. That isn't what matters. Being aware, playing together as a team, being an asset to your raiding team, that is what is significant for any tank in World of Warcraft. I see so many tanks, so many people, rather, that just spend some talent points, put on armor, and they think they're tanks. And then whenever a mechanic comes up that requires them to adapt or something happens that they didn't expect, they just collapse and the raid wipes because of it. You are going to have, uh, you are going to play an integral role to your guild success or failure as a tank, perhaps more so than any other uh, person or any other role in the guild. And having a good tanking team is crucial. For instance, on a particular Wrath server, Angrafard, I played in Dreamstate with a fellow called Eitem. I believe he's still playing in Dreamstate. He's still one of the guys in charge of Dreamstate. And we got along pretty well as a tanking team. And as a result of that, we enjoyed a good deal of success on this server because we played together as a team.
What are the differences between Wrath and Burning Crusade? Well, in Burning Crusade, the way I would describe the prop paladin is you're a melee caster, a melee mage, if you will. You're basically a guy wearing plate, going in melee and using AoE spells, specifically Consecration, to generate threat. You still have Consecration and Wrath, but because of the abilities of Hammer and Shield of Righteousness, which scale based on physical stats and uh, physical stats like Weapon DPS, Block Value, Rely on Hit and Expertise, uh, you really turn into the Holy Warrior that Paladins should have been in from the start, instead of the like weird combination of Mage and Mage wearing plate, which is what the vanilla and BC Paladins are about. So you really become a powerful Holy Warrior. Now, if you want to know what you need to do in the transition from Burning Crusade to Wrath, the only thing I can tell you is getting physical rings, physical tank rings, like the ones that druids would use or warriors would use, though you have more in common warriors than druids because you care about block value. Uh, getting those kind of items like block value, hit, expertise is going to matter quite a bit for yourself as a prop paladin. In the description of this video, you will find a link to an item set that I've made, uh, like a very good item set that you can have and get in the RAF pre patch that you can then use in uh, Wrath of the Lich King itself. It's uh, this one in particular on 70 upgrades. Now what you need to know about the items like Hel Helm of Ufer's Resolve is the items themselves will change, the plate items in particular will change from having spell damage and healing to having strength or melee stats in, in, in general. So you don't have to worry about tier items or offset piece, plate offset pieces, though you may worry about weapons. You will want a melee weapon like Brutal Gladiator's uh, Pummeler or some other tanking weapon. You shouldn't worry too much about Wrath of Lich King pre-raid gearing, by the way, at least from TBC, because you can replace a lot of things. Though I would worry about things like rings, necks, shoulders, etc. Because some items can be difficult to replace. Though I'll make a detailed gearing guide for uh, the pre-patch, for pre-raid and tier 7 gearing later on, once we actually get the tools and we see what the stats are on the items. In, uh, in the Wrath of the Lich King uh, beta. But what all you need to know in terms of difference is you're no longer using spell power because you can get it through a talent. Uh, rather, you're using physical stats. That's all you really need to know and you need to adapt to that when you're making that transition from Burning Crusade to Wrath of the Lich King. Now let's talk about two things that make prop paladins extremely powerful in Wrath. I mean, their holy damage is very useful from a threat and damage perspective, but their survivability is what makes them kings in terms of tanking ability. And their survivability comes uh, from two things. One is cooldowns, raid cooldowns. You have Divine Guardian, which is a raid wall that reduces the damage the entire raid takes, including yourself. And you can make a cancel aura macro that you can use and you use this when you're dealing with very high damage abilities. By the way, sometimes you may want to use Divine Sacrifice when your group or your other tank, because you likely will be grouped with another tank, when they're taking a lot of damage. You don't need to cancel Aura, you just want to cancel Aura if you're taking a lot of damage at the same time because you don't want to die from the effect of Divine Sacrifice. This is something Holy Paladins also have, uh, but yours, uh, Divine Sacrifice, is, uh, is very, very powerful for you. Like, they wouldn't use Divine Sacrifice, you can't. Uh, but then there is Ardent Defender, and this is really the meat of what makes Projection Paladins incredibly powerful in Wrath of the Lich King. What does Ardent Defender do? Well, Ardent Defender, the way it works in Wrath of the Lich King, or rather the way it works in Burning Crusade, let's go with that first. The way it works in Burning Crusade is that once you reach 35% HP, the hits after that that would take you lower get the damage reduction, but it's only after you've reached that HP threshold. So say for instance, if you take a hit, a massive hit, it will kill you. But if you take two smaller hits, one drops you below 35% HP, the other one would kill you, but our defender kicks in and saves your life or reduces the damage that you're taking. That's how it works in Burning Crusade, and we call that leapfrogging when you had the hit uh, that uh, did a lot of damage. I've been playing Prop Paladin since retail Burning Crusade. It was a factor back then. The change they made in Wrath, and not initially, but with patches, the change they made with Art and Defender made it incredibly potent. So what did they do with Art and Defender in particular? Well, they eliminated the leapfrogging. So say, for instance, you're taking a massive hit, you won't 
uh, that is equal to your HP, it won't kill you. It won't even proc the cheat death. I'm not talking about the cheat death here. That's a separate discussion. But rather what that hit will do, it will have its damage reduced. So say for instance, I am a 30,000 HP tank. The hit I'm taking, if you're a warrior druid DK, or you don't have Ardent Defender spec as a prop paladin, you take 30,000 damage, you're dead. What happens when a prop paladin gets hit for 30,000 uh, damage if he has 30,000 HP? Well, he's not going to take 30,000 damage. He's not going to proc the cheat death. That might come in factor later. What's going to happen is you're going to take that 30,000 damage and you're going to multiply it by 0.65 because that's 65% of damage that you're going to take uh, regularly. So you're going to get a, a full hit of 19,500 damage. That leaves... Uh, that leaves 10,500 damage from that 30k hit. What happens to that? Well, you multiply that, you do a multiplier of 0 0.8 to account for the 20% damage reduction. So on this single hit, if we do the math, we add, so on the single hit, you've reduced the damage that you're taking from 30,000 to 28,000 almost. You're reducing the damage of the hit by 2000 and you're staying alive and this is happening all the time it's happening passively to you as a prop paladin in wrath the lich king this is the uh gist of what makes prop paladins so great as tanks from a survival perspective because being able to passively reduce the damage of a hit that would kill you by 2000 again and again and again is incredibly potent for a tank survivability and even if it fails you still have the cheat death effect of Arden Defender to fall back on. This is what makes Pro Prop Paladins so incredibly st strong because not only can they survive hits that would kill other tanks with the cheat death but even but they can prevent it from proccing in the first place because they just take less damage 2000 damage may not seem like a lot but one of the things to understand is that the way a lot of raft the lich king bosses or the majority of raft the lich king bosses the way they work when it comes to uh abilities that can kill tanks they're not doing constant damage by and large things like algalon are the exception not the rule algalon does a lot of consistent damage but he's the exception. By and large, what happens is like the Sendragosa or Saffron situation where they have special attacks that will do a significant amount of damage in a single hit. By the way, this also applies to the Lich King himself because the Lich King does exactly this. He does huge damage abilities that can kill you if you're not careful. And so a prop paladin is much better at surviving the vast array of abilities that work like this. By the way, that 30,000 HP and damage that I'm talking about, to have an understanding of what 30,000 HP means, 30,000 HP is what you'd get unbuffed with close to tier 7, Nax 2.0, best in slot, gearing from 25 men. Uh, after that, you'll probably end up like 60,000 or 70,000 in Ice Crown Citadel. And it always scales, by the way, it always scales. It's based on your HP. What's the problem with this? Because there are some issues with this, of course. Well, it means that you're very dependent on your stamina, more so than other tanks, though stacking stamina is the go-to method for every tank, but you care about them more than they do. And the other factor is that it causes spiky damage. And that's something a lot of healers do dislike and may not be prepared for. So healers, from my experience, the ones I've talked to, what they generally want is a tank to take as much consistent damage as possible. But the fact is, in Wrath of the Lich King, that's just not going to be possible. Not only, be not only because, well, bosses have very high damaging abilities that they use on an interval, but because you also have tank cooldowns. A lot of cooldowns, internal, external cooldowns that you'll be using. People, uh, healers just need to adapt to the fact that, healer that tanks will take more damage sometimes and a lot less damage other times depending on the cooldown or the talents that the particular tank has or the class that the particular tank does have it's something they need to play around with but it's also something you need to be uh, to consider as a tank because it's something you need to be aware of because it is going to affect how you're gonna get healed 
Now with that said, let's talk about talent builds. I'll actually start with leveling a leveling build for anyone that's interested in that. Like if you want to level a paladin from one to 80, well, first off, I'd recommend you not do it because leveling is probably going to be a miserable experience given the fact that Blizzard has added the boost and they've removed the, the random dungeon finder. But if you want to do it, and I'm sure some people will do, what I recommend is going like this. It's five points Benediction, two points Improved Judgments, three points Heart of the Crusader, and a level 20 Seal of Command, with two points in Pursuit of Justice. After we've spent these points, you want to start going into the Protection Tree, Divine Strength, all that, as far as you can go. And you want to keep doing this until you're like either 50, so you can get Avenger Shield, or you go until 60, where you can get Hammer of the Righteous, and then you respec and you get Hammer of the Righteous. After that, after you get Hammer, you spend 51 points in the Protection Tree to be able to uh, to get Hammer. After that, you just want to uh, start spending points and Retribution. But anyway, what's your uh, what's your baseline talent build? Actually, talk a bit about more about leveling just to not forget this. One of the things you want to pick up while leveling is to get the cleave Glyph of Seal of Command. One of the problems you'll have while leveling as a Paladin is mana. You just don't have any mana regeneration. Spiritual Attunement is a talent in Deep Prot, and it can take you a lot of time. Blessing of Sanctuary is just not going to give you enough mana, so you need some way to get mana back. And... The only way really is Glyph of Seal of Command until you're 72, then you get Divine Play. But yeah, Seal of Command will, a Glyph of Seal of Command will give you 8% of your base mana each time you use a Judgment with Seal of Command active. All right. So in terms of talent builds, uh, Divine Strength 5 points for the 15% 15, uh, 15 strength bonus. This is not just attack power, it's also a block value. 5 points in Anticipation for the 5% dodge, 3 points in Improved Righteous Fury for 6% damage reduction, 5 points in Toughness for 10% armor. Armor still matters, it's not as important as, for, uh, as, uh, as stamina for you. Um, you don't have, like, usually when it comes to armor, the conversion rate is like one point of stamina equal 10 points of armor. For you, it's not quite like that. Stamina is more useful, but you still want a lot of armor. Uh, then two points Divine Guardian, one point Blessing, Blessing of Sanctuary, three points Improved Devotion Aura. You should be specced into this, and Holy Paladin shouldn't spec into it. Uh, I'm tempted to just talk about the Holy uh, Paladin tree, but one of the things Holy Paladins want is not improved devotion aura they want improved blessing of wisdom and improved concentration aura don't sack if you're playing holy paladin don't sacrifice these two they're very useful far more useful than you having improved devotion aura which a prop paladin should have unless you really really want reckoning which isn't going to be that important for them uh, then three points in one-handed weapon specialization, two points in sacred duty for the extra stamina, and the cooldown reduction on divine protection, which is your shield wall. One point in holy shield, one point in spiritual attunement. Don't go two points, it's not really needed, and you want the talent points for some other things. There are plenty of ways to gain mana outside of spiritual attunement. In spiritual attunement, you do want to spend one point because you do want to gain some mana back, but you don't want to focus too much on it. It's not going to be your primary mana regeneration. Divine play will be. Hell, even Sanctuary can be a lot, uh, regenerate a lot more mana than that. Three points in Art and Defender for the reasons I listed earlier about why it's so important. Uh, three points in Combat Expertise, Stamina, Chance to Critically Hit, and Six Expertise is quite a lot. Three points Redoubt for the extra block value, so you're doing more damage and taking less damage at the same time. One point Avenger Shield, three points Touch by Light. Touch by Light is what makes your Consecration worth a damn as Prop Paladin, because you're going to focus on melee stats, you're going to focus on strength and block value expertise and all that. This is how you convert that strength into spell damage, which Consecration still uses in Wrath of the Lich King. Uh, then two points in Guard the By Light. Reduces spell damage taken and gives you a 100% chance to refresh the duration of your Divine Plea. This is important because you want to keep the Divine Play during a boss fight 100% up, actually. You want to keep the Divine Play as, uh, uh, as often as possible up, because it's your way of regenerating mana. And this is the talent that allows you to do it, as well as reducing the spell damage you're taking. Three points in Shield of the Templar, you need to spend these. Reduce all damage taken by 3% and grants your Avenger Shield a 100% chance of silence. Really nice to get those casters in melee. And then one point in Hammer of the Righteous. Do you spend two points? Do you bother with, ha with judgments of the just? Vast majority of situations, no. Why is that? Well, because for any DK, Frost DK specifically, will have the ability to reduce attack speed, as will plenty of other people. 
in a much better fashion. It isn't worth spending the points in Judgment of the Just, unless you're really running without anyone in a group, specifically for 10-man heroic rating, that just doesn't have a way of reducing attack power. Maybe then you're tempted to do so, but the vast majority of times, like 90%, 80 90% of the time, it's not worth it. Okay, moving on to the Retribution tree. Don't bother with the Holy Tree, it doesn't exist. Like, you might be tempted, oh, Seals of the Pure can be useful. No, your Seals and Judgment uh, damage is not the primary method of you generating damage. Hammer of the Righteous and Shield of Righteousness are. You're focusing on improving their damage, not improving your CL damage. Your CL damage, your auto attacks, reckoning, all that, they are completely useless or relevant compared to just increasing your damage with Hammer of the Righteous and Shield of Righteousness. So anyway, moving to Retribution, find points in Deflection. If you're struggling with mana and you might, d dependent on how Blizzard does the damage, you might want to spend some points in Benediction instead, but that's, I don't believe you will need to do so. Maybe in tier 7 and like Nax 10 potentially, but honestly most of the time it won't be needed. Uh, two points and improved judgment. Some people say, oh, you only need to spend three points, but reality is you spend only one point and improved judgment, so you're not going to be able to access the tree here. I guess you could only spend one point and then just get one point in Benediction or something like that. Personally, I just spent two points. Just have that cooldown reduced. It isn't going to matter for your regular rotation, the difference between one or two points, but in other situations, burst threat particularly can be useful. Okay, so you've unlocked Seal of Command, Conviction, and Pursuit of Justice. Two points in Pursuit of Justice, uh, three points in Conviction, and then you get Crusade. Okay, so you have two points left. What do you do with these two points? You could just throw them into Conviction. As an example, get that 5% crit. This matter, the reason this matters is because it's going to increase your crit chance with Hammer and Shield. And Hammer and Shield, as I've said again and again, are your primary methods of generating threat. Everything else is insignificant in comparison to that. Don't view, I'll talk about the rotation in just a bit, but don't view the rotation, don't view the Prop Paladin as having a rotation. You don't have a rotation, you have a priority list. And your priority goes Shield, Hammer, Shield, Hammer, Shield, Hammer. Something like a Judgment is a filler, Consecration of filler, everything else is a filler in comparison to that. But I'll talk, I'll talk about rotation in just a second. But okay, you can spend five points in Conviction. Or you can get one point in Seal of Command. For boss tanking, Seal of Command is worthless. You don't use it. The reason you don't use it is because of Seal of Vengeance. And the reason you want to use Seal of Vengeance doesn't come even to its damage. If it was just purely about damage, I would say it's not really worth bothering too much about. You could use Seal of Righteousness for all that mattered. But it comes down to this Glyph. Glyph of Seal of Vengeance. You get 10 Expertise, which is quite a lot, uh, while Seal of Vengeance or Seal of Corruption are active. Now, you get 6 Expertise from Combat Expertise. You get 10 from the Glyph of Seal of Vengeance. What that means is ba your baseline expertise from talents is 16. How much expertise do you want? 60 for the parry, parry cap, parry expertise cap, which you will want to achieve. The point here is you don't want to use Seal of Command when you're tanking bosses. However, when you're do dealing with five mans, while you're leveling, when you're AoE tanking, having Seal of Command is useful. I guess in the very best situation, if you're really min-maxing, you would have two specs, two prot specs. One with a seal of, cor a seal of Command, so you can use it for AoE situations, and one with five points in Conviction. But I'd say in a lot of cases, you can go just fine with Seal of Command. I'm not too fond of this, but it depends on what you're tanking. Like, say, for instance, if you're going to be in that situation where you're tanking ads on, on boss or you're dealing with a lot of trash constantly or mass pulling a lot of trash, you will want to have Seal of Command, but it's a very specific situation. Um, what about Vindication, the chance to reduce attack power? From my perspective in a 25-man raiding situation, the, the job uh, it's the job of warriors or druids to reduce the attack power, or even warlocks, put the Curse of Weakness on the target to reduce the attack power of a target. But if you don't have them, like in a 10-man situation, you're only running War Warlock, you don't have a druid, you don't have a feral druid bear to help you tank, or you don't have a DPS warrior, then yeah, you might want to get these two points in Vindication. Keep in mind that you are sacrificing crit, which is sacrificing single target threat, and people can absolutely go bananas in terms of single target threat in Wrath of the Lich King. 
It wasn't a factor on retail, but private servers have certainly disproven that. And I think in classic, we've seen so far how important single target threat can be or threat in general can be. That's one of the reasons I don't want to spend the point in Zealot Command, because 1% crit is worth more than Zealot Command in terms of the vast majority of boss tanking. Okay, so those are your talents. This is your general setup talent build. 51 points, just 51 points in prediction to unlock Hammer of, of the Righteous, and 20 points in Retribution. How you spend the points in Retribution depends on your choice, depends on your raid, depends on your situation. You have some options, Vindication, Seal of Command, Conviction. There are some choices there. Some people will firmly argue in, in favor of spending points in Reckoning. I've personally never seen a reason to bother with it most of the time. But that's my perspective, and I'm the kind of guy who really, fo who really thinks like this. I don't care about my sustained threat, which is what Reckoning would serve. I care about my burst threat. And I care about doing as much threat as possible in the shortest time period as possible. Um, and I also care about doing a lot of damage, and you'll certainly do a lot more damage if you crit more than you will with Reckoning, from my perspective. Uh, Glyph-wise, um, so one of them is Glyph of Seal of Vengeance. What about the other two? The other essential one is Righteous Defense, because your taunts are still spells, and they are affected by spell hit, 16% or 17%, whatever. Um, so you need, uh, you need spell hit. Or you get the Glyph of Righteous Defense, which gives you 8% chance for your Righteous Defense of Have a Reckoning, which are affected by spell hit, to hit the target. So you only need what, 8% hit otherwise. You also get 3% from a Druid, Feral Druid, uh, from a Balanced Druid specifically. So you really only need like 5-6% hit on your character. And you shouldn't be stressed too much about getting hit. Your taunts will generally land and you have two taunts as well to work with. Uh, so it, it's not going to be a problem. What about the third glyph? What should you go with the third glyph? Well, the general one is the glyph of divine play. I believe, though I'm not 100% certain, I guess we'll see with the classic beta, but I believe it stacks with some other talents. So with divine play active, you take 3% reduced damage from all sources. Well, I guess I'm curious is it if it works with Shield of the Templar or, or if it stacks with Blessing of Sanctuary, if they stack together or not. Or with uh, Discipline Priest talent, I believe it is, that does the same thing. It's like 3% damage reduction. I, I think the Discipline talent doesn't stack with Blessing of Sanctuary, but I'm not sure how this affects Cliff of Divine Plate. If it does stack, if they stack together, yeah, it's really good. 3% damage reduction is significant. Um, other choices that you may have for AoE tanking, Glyph of Hammer of Righteous, can be particularly good. Or maybe Glyph of Exorcism for some crazy pulls, because you can use Exorcism as a puller and can be uh, very useful in that situation. But outside that, there's not much to really worry about here in uh, the talent tree. You shouldn't worry about Shield of Righteousness or anything like that. You will have enough mana to not worry about Glyph of Seal of Command. Minor glyph-wise, nothing really matters. I guess like having glyph of uh, lay on hands is going to be useful in certain situations. Though you're not gonna really going to use lay on hands on yourself, you're going to use it on someone else. Why is that? Well, because quite frankly, lay on hands will trigger your forbearance cooldown. And you want to have the forbearance to use divine protection as your shield wall. So you're, most of the time you're not going to be able to lay your on hands yourself, but what you can do with lay on hands is you can use it on a healer and give them some mana back. Sustain, healer mana sustainability is going to be, be a major factor in Wrath of the Lich King, so having this glyph can be useful. Outside of that, none of the glyphs, well, Sense of Dead can be useful, like 1% damage against Undead when this is active, yeah, but it's, it's something nice. And everything else is just like pointless, like these blessing glyphs and the wise, they're just completely and utterly pointless from my perspective. So don't even bother with them. Just get these two glyphs for minor glyphing. And that's how you uh, select your talents and select your glyphs. Those are the things you need to worry about. In terms of your consumables, there's already only three consumables you're going to worry about. The first one is Flask of Stone Blood for the extra HP. Just use these, have like four or five per raid, you'll be quite fine. Indestructible, uh, indestructible potions, remember that in Wrath of the Lich King you pre-pot because you can only use one potion per combat phase. Though you can pre-pot to get basically two. So you pre-pot, if it matters, many times on a lot of bosses it won't necessarily matter. So you don't really have to pre-pot, unless it's a hard-hitting boss. And then uh, in terms of food, you can use the fish feast, but you also have the Rhinolicious Warm Steak. 
Now, this is useful for the 40 expertise rating. This is quite a bit of expertise, and this is going to be your primary food that you're going to use as a prop paladin in Wrath. If you're fighting a boss where it actually matters. For like farm raids, uh, it's not really going to be important what food you use, as long as you're getting the stamina, you can use the fish feast if you so desire strength food. But for any boss that is significant, or for any run that is significant, like speed running, achievement running, progression, use the Rhinolicious Worm Steak. And those are your consumables, the three main consumables that you're going to use as a prop paladin. This brings me to rotation, pre-pull, AoE, and single target. Pre-pull, you want to Put up Sacred Shield on yourself to have the Absorb. Then you want to use Divine Plea about 5 or so seconds before you do. Then an Indestructible Potion an indestructible potion if you need it, if the boss is going to hit hard from the get-go. And then you may or may not want to cast Avenging Wrath. It depends on the situation. Are you going to benefit from that Avenging Wrath or are you going to position the boss? If you're positioning the boss, you may want to wait with casting Avenging Wrath and use it a bit later, a couple of seconds later. Uh, then in terms of spells that are actually going to hit the boss, you want to potentially use Exorcism. Now, Exorcism can miss, but if it hits, and if it hits an Undead specifically, it can do a lot of fret and damage. An Undead in particular, it's going to always crit. It is a cast, so you're going to have to time that properly with the pull timer. You might be using Sacred Shield and Divine Plea a bit earlier than you may want to. You might be popping that Indestructible Potion a bit earlier. Um, just keep that in mind. Then, most of the time, you're going to want to use Hand of Reckoning as either your puller or right after Exorcism. You may even benefit, if you're pulling with Exorcism, from having another tank taunt the boss from you right after Exorcism hits. Then you do your own Hand of Reckoning. The way Hand of Reckoning works in Wrath is that it does damage if a boss or mob isn't targeting you and then focuses their attention on you. You almost always want to use it on a pull because you want the focus to be on you. If a mob spawns in a fight, you want to hand of reckoning it. If an ant spawns, a boss spawns, use it as your first ability. Don't use anything else unless you get the time to cast an exorcism, then hit them with a hand of reckoning. Uh, then follow that hand of reckoning with Avenger Shield as the boss is still heading towards you or the mobs are heading towards you. For AoE, you use Seal of Command if you have it, if not Seal of Vengeance. Uh, and when I say AoE, I mean AoE. I mean more than four or five mobs. If you're talking about four, less than four or five mobs, use Seal of Vengeance. It, the expertise bonus will be more important there. But if you're talking like five, 10, 20 mobs, yeah, use Seal of Command. It's more important. Uh, and then your priority is Hammer of the Righteous, followed by Consecration, followed by Holy Shield, followed by Shield of Righteousness on a single target, and keeping up Sacred Shield. That's your priority list not your rotation priority list use these abilities as they're coming off cooldown instantly the moment they come off cooldown and then we get into the discussion of single target for single target priority you will be using seal of vengeance and then you are going to focus on shield of righteousness and hammer of the righteous but why these two abilities above all others? Well, it comes down to what they're doing. Hammer of the Righteous does a lot of damage based on your weapon DPS. Four times your weapon DPS and it's holy damage. Shield of Righteousness slams your target. Shield slam ability that does damage based on your block value and an additional 520 uh, 20 damage. These two abilities are your main damage and fret abilities. They, you should prioritize these abilities above everything else. However, however, which one should you use over the other? Well, it depends on your gearing. Early on, and I'd say until Trial of the Grand Crusader at the very least, if not Ice Crown Citadel, Shield of Righteousness is going to do more damage and fret than Hammer of the Righteous. But after that, you're going to get weapons with such high, high DPS that you're going to Eclipse Shield. So it's going to change dependent on the gear that you have. But there's more to this story than just that because Blizzard does love to mess with people. And so they added Librams like this Librum, Librum of Obstruction. Librams that have a buff to say or block value depend, uh, that require you to use another ability. In this case, in the case of Libra, Librum of Obstruction, which is a badge of heroism a Librum that you get from 5 Man Heroics or Nax 10. And it's very cheap. I think it's like 15 badge, badges of heroism. You get, whenever you use a judgment, 
352 block value for 10 seconds. So you wanna use this, uh, you wanna use judgment to get this buff, it is a buff, before you shield slam. And then in Old War, it's even better, you get Librum of Sacred Shield. This drops from General Vezax and gives you 450 block value for 20 seconds each time you use Holy Shield, which basically means that you're gonna want to use Holy Shield before you before you do the poll. You want to use a pre-poll because 20 seconds is certainly a significant amount of, of time. Most of the time you wouldn't care about using Holy Shield pre-poll because it's really going to run out and it messes with other abilities. But yeah, you would put Holy Shield at the top of the list uh, there before you even Sacred Shield or Divine Play. But this brings me to the single target priority. Uh, use your Librem ability. That's your top priority if you have a Librem that increases your damage and then for tier 7 you'll be using shield of righteousness uh, followed up in the priority list by hammer of the righteous followed by judgment holy shield consecration and keeping up sacred shield if you have a weapon with very high weapon dps and not necessarily a lot of block value hammer of the righteous takes priority over shield of righteousness crucially this isn't a rotation ladies and gentlemen you don't rotate these abilities. You use them the moment they come off cooldown. The mistake I see in a lot of guides, and I can tell you, I've played with some really high, uh, high level DPSers, highly skilled, that were roasting my ass on the frame meter. And the way I dealt with that is I ignored anyone who told me, oh, use a rotation. No, I shield slammed and hammered every single boss. And I kept fret against people doing 12k DPS in Old War on Hodir, against people doing 10k on other bosses, I was able to keep fret on them. Ignore anyone who tells you, use a rotation like shield, judgment, hammer, all that, is worthless advice. Do shield followed by hammer. If you need to judge, you're judging because you want to get the Librem buff, not because judgment is doing a lot. And you want to keep Holy Shield up as much as possible, of course, Consecration and Sacred Shield up as much as possible, but it isn't your main priority. Doing a lot of shields and hammers in a fight is the most important thing for you as a tank, especially when you pull or when you're pos uh, when uh, aggro may reset or something spawns in fight, that one ad spawns in a fight, you shield, follow up immediately with hammer, if you have the Librum ability up. If you don't, get it up, shield, hammer, or hammer shield. That's what you should do. Get used to it. There is no rotation. Wipe it from your memory. If you ever heard anyone telling you there is a prop paladin rotation, I can tell you, hand on heart, they've never dealt with DPSers that were roasting their ass on the frame meter. I have, and this is what I did to deal with it. And then finally, what you want to have, not rotation, but still something I felt I should put here in this video somewhere, is you want to have a cancel aura macro for divine uh, sacrifice and divine shield, and then mouse over macros for at least cleanse, hand of protection, and sacrifice. I will provide a paste bin link in this video where I will add my current macros that you can use yourself. They should work in RAF Classic, I hope. If not, I'll adjust them as necessary but I do assume that they are going to work. Gearing priority-wise, you are going to get it, uh, defense and resilience to reach the crit cap, the 5% chance to reduce critical blows. Ideally, you would do so only for defense, but when you're gearing up, you may be using resilience, or if even if you're fully raid geared, you may still use some resilience to help you reach it. You need 540 defense minus any resilience that you have to get that 5% chance to not get crit by bosses. After that, you get stamina over armor. Armor is still important, don't ignore that aspect because it reduces the damage you're taking, but you wanna prioritize stamina over armor. Though many times you will get pieces that have quite a lot of armor on them, you may have a bit less stamina, but you wanna use the armor pieces, like some legs in Old War and a nice Crown Citadel are really good for this. After you've increased your survivability, you're not taking crits, you've got a lot of stamina and armor, uh, you want to get the expertise dodge cap. This is about 20 expertise with a 5% chance of your blows not being dodged or parried. Uh, the dodge cap is 5%, pretty certain about that. The parry cap is 15%, I think. Could be wrong a bit on this, you know, exact values are, I could be wrong on exact values, but that's 
what uh, but what's important here really is you want to get the dodge cap whatever that is and you want to get the expertise parry cap eventually as for this final row you have hit block value and expertise that are going to be important for your fret your hit cap is eight percent for physical six percent plus improved fairy fire for your taunts you don't you're not gonna get the spell hit cap do you do have that eight percent glyph um eight percent chance to hit with your taunts from glyphs most of the time i don't really prioritize hit too much I instead focus on the expertise parry cap and block value i think those are more important but i think overall i think overall you want to achieve some kind of decent balance between hit block value and getting expertise past uh, the dodge cap you will unlikely ever be able to get both the hit cap and the expertise parry cap and a lot of block value that's highly unlikely hell it's highly unlikely that regardless of the gearing you're using unless you're gemming for it that you'll get both hit cap and expertise parry cap unless you're talking about very high level gearing and even then not so much so there are trade-offs but i think you prioritize expertise then you get then you do a balance between hit block value and the parry cap on expertise like get the dodge cap then balance those other stats out and that's all you need to know about the Protection Paladin in Wrath of the Lich King Classic. We pretty much got all we wanted coming from Burning Crusade into Wrath of the Lich King. We got much better single target threat, burst threat, cooldowns, raid cooldowns, uh, personal cooldowns. Prop Paladins became a lot stronger. And we ended up surpassing warriors in pretty much every single way with the exception of AoE tanking. And that's what warrior tanks got reduced to in Wrath of the Lich King. The best AoE tanks in the game. Garbage on bosses. Oh. That was a twist of fate. Justice, I call it. When I was playing Burning Crusade on retail, I found myself in so many situations where a lot of guilds flat out refused to even take me, even concern me, regardless of my gearing experience, awareness, communication, just because I was playing a prop paladin and I wanted to main tank. And it's like, well, that's a job for a warrior. We just want you to tank ads, if even that. Uh, but things did end up changing for the better in Wrath. Though I speak of the Paladin being the best tank in Wrath, that's really something that took a while to develop. When Wrath launched, we were all bending the knee to the Death Knight Overlords. Not even the Blood DKs, just Death Knights in general with their hybrid specs, cooldowns, etc. Though Blizzard did make changes that tweaked Death Knights and made them a lot less overpowered. They're, though they're still pretty strong, uh, a very strong class as a DPS. I mean, the meta and Wrath from a rating perspective is going to be DK, Lock, Mage, and Paladin. Like, those are the classes you're going to stack. Maybe Druids and Priests to a lesser extent, but yeah, that's kind of how things are going to be in Wrath of the Lich King Classic. I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, if you have any questions or want to give me any feedback, feel free to hop on the Discord or leave a comment in the comment section. The link to this Discord is in the description of uh, this video. Check out the paste bin for the macros, the Cancellara macros, the mouse over macros that I've made. Hopefully they will work in classic. If they don't, I will update that paste bin as necessary. And for everyone that does enjoy my content, for all of you that have supported me over the years, I want to say thank you. I want to uh, say especially big thanks to Jay, Vakre, Elaine, and Anthony, among many others that have shown their support in one way or another over the years. I wouldn't be here without that support so huge thanks and to anyone who's willing and able to do so consider donating via paypal or patreon or join uh, the youtube channel membership would certainly be very useful these kind of videos take a lot of time and effort and dedication um, to do i've been playing a prop paladin for 15 years and i think one of the one of the things to understand about playing any class or role very well in wow it's not something you should ever get comfortable with. You, sh you always have something more to learn, new things to discover, ways to improve your gameplay, your UI, your playstyle, your awareness, your communication, all that. It's always a constant journey of self-improvement, if you want to call it that. So stay tuned, boys and girls, because there is more coming.